this is my home. Little boy, B.H. Fairchild. The sun lowers on our backyard in Kansas. And I am looking up through the circling spokes of a bicycle, asking my father as mindlessly as I would ask if he ever saw DiMaggio or Mantle, why we dropped the bomb on those two towns in Japan. And his face goes all wooden, the eyes freezing like rabbits in headlights. The palm of his hand slowly tapping the arm of a lawn chair that has appeared in family photographs since 1945 the shadow of my mother thrown across it, the green Packard in the background, which my father said he bought because after Saipan and Tinian and Okinawa, I felt like they owed it to me. These were names I didn't know, islands distant as planets, anonymous. Where is Saipan? Where is Okinawa? Where is the Pacific? Could you see the cloud in the air? Like the smoke from Eugene Messenbaum's semi, that huge cloud when he rolled it out on Highway 54 last winter. The hand is hammering the chair arm, beating it, and I know it's all wrong as I move backward on the garage floor and watch his eyes watching the sun in his evening burial and the spreading silver light and then darkness over the farms and vast flat fields, which I will grow so tired of, so weary of years later that I will leave. Watching then as I do now, his eyes, as they take in the falling rag of the sun, a level stare, a gaze that asks nothing and gives nothing, the sun burning itself to ashes constantly, the orange maze blackening in drought and waste, and he can do nothing. And neither can I. November 29, 1963. Life Magazine. Christopher Bursk. A week later, he's still being shot in every room of your house even though it takes perhaps a second for him to buckle over, the camera draws out the descent till the distance between head and lap seems as great as that between the window a man flings himself out and the sidewalk he splatters on. By the time you're in the bedroom, the president's dead. You've seen people wounded in movies the body doing its best to accommodate its unexpected guest, closing around the bullet the way members of a family might gather around a visitor to make him feel at home. But this is the leader of the free world. Your father and mother can't stop gazing at his corpse. They spread it flat on the kitchen table. They carry it to the bathroom. That's the only way they know to make sense of the death, to fill their house with it. Your sister's face down on her bed, nothing left to do but lie still, as one newscaster retraces the bullet's path. Another describes the wound. Again and again, the body crumples up, 
grown tired of all the work required just to hold the head in one place. It makes his choice over and over, collapsing. The only possibility left it. The only thing is still free to do. The Garden. Dorian Lux. We were talking about poetry. We were talking about nuclear war. She said she couldn't write about it because she couldn't imagine it. I said it was simple. Imagine this doorknob is the last thing you will see in this world. Imagine you happen to be standing at the door when you look down, about to grasp the knob. Your fingers curled toward it, the doorknob old and black with oil from being turned so often in your hand, cranky with rust and grease from the kitchen. Imagine it happens this quickly before you have time to think of anything else, your kids, your own life, what it will mean. You reach for the knob and the window flares white, though you see it only from the corner of your eye because you're looking at the knob, intent on opening the back door to the patch of sunlight on the porch. That garden spread below the stairs and the single tomato you might pick for a salad. But when the flash comes, you haven't thought that far ahead. It is only the simple desire to move into the sun that possesses you. The thought of the garden that tomato would have come after you had taken the knob in your hand, just beginning to twist it. And when the window turns white, you are only about to touch it, preparing to open the door. 